Good morning. If you could please turn with me to John chapter 10. And pray before we start. Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for the message that you've given to me, Lord. I ask that you would continue to speak through me as I speak to your congregation today, Lord. I ask, Lord, that we would all have eyes and ears open to see and hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would just fill this place. May we see your presence in a very tangible way today, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So John chapter 10, we're going to be reading verses 1 through 21. And it says, Very truly I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him, because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know the sheep, and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, But I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. The Jews who heard these words were again divided. Many of them said, He is demon-possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But others said, These are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? This passage here in John chapter 10 is really the only parable found in the book of John. If you read through Matthew and Luke, they're full of parables, and I believe Mark has some as well, but this is the only parable in the book of John. And given the current situation of the day that Jesus was in at this time, he was kind of speaking along the lines of the leadership that was in place at the time. And this passage comes in the middle of Jesus, a series of Jesus saying different I am quotes, which goes right in line with John's intent for his gospel account. If you read through the gospels, have you ever wondered why there are four gospels to begin with? It would be very easy to just have one gospel account, have all four gospels just throw everything in one book, or have all four gospel accounts say the exact same thing. It would be very easy to do that. But there are four gospel accounts because there are four different ways of looking at who Jesus is. Matthew is writing to the Jews. Each book has a different audience as well. 
Matthew is writing to the Jews primarily, and he's saying that Jesus is the king of the Jews. Luke is writing, he's a Gentile, he's the only Gentile writer in the Bible, but he's talking about how Jesus is the savior of the world. He's not just the king of the Jews, but he's also the savior of the world. Mark writes to show that Jesus is the son of man. And John writes to show us that Jesus is the Son of God. So that's the series of I am statements by Jesus. In John 6.35, he says, I am the bread of life. In John 8.12, he says, I am the light of the world. In John 8.58, he says, before Abraham was, I am. I I think that's very powerful. John 11.25 He says, I am the resurrection and the life. And in John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And in the middle of all these I am statements, here in John chapter 10, Jesus says, I am the gate and I am the good shepherd. So I'm going to take a few minutes to focus on the phrase, I am the gate. This is in contrast to Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, which a lot of people use out of context in witnessing to other people. Revelation 3, 20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears me and my voice, I will come in and eat with them and they with me. And people use that in witnessing, which is not a verse to be used in witnessing because it's not saying that Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart. That actually belittles Jesus. The reference of Revelation 3.20, Jesus is actually talking to the church that he no longer attends because Laodicea grew so lukewarm that Jesus is like, I can't stay here anymore. I want to spit you out of my mouth. Jesus is the gate. He is the door. Going back to John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He says, the gatekeeper stands watch over the sheep at night. You have to understand that in this area, the sheep were brought into the sheep pen at nighttime because there's a lot of predators that the sheep would have to be aware of. So they would bring the sheep in at night And the gatekeeper would stay at the gate, watching over the sheep during the nighttime, protect them. So Jesus enters through the gate, but he is also the gate himself. Anyone who doesn't come through Jesus is not to be trusted. And Jesus says, before me there was no gate, there was no door. So Jesus keeps us safe in the sheep pen, but he also sends us back out into the pasture, into the world. And this is the call of the Great Commission. And there's a video on YouTube, it's called The Gospel by Eric Ludi. It's one of my favorite YouTube videos, and he gives a very good representation of the gospel and does a great job describing what the gospel is. And it shows a guy in a prison cell and how he's sitting in the corner of this prison and he's got uh, chains around his hands and ankles. And the gospel message, Jesus breaks those chains off of him, sets him free. But he's still in the jail cell. And... Jesus says, check the door. I didn't just break the chains off of your hands and ankles for you to still be sitting in this jail cell. I broke the chains off of the door as well. Leave the jail cell, go out into the world, share my message with other people. Galatians 5.1 says, it is for freedom that he has set us free. Leonard Ravenhill said, The greatest miracle that God can do today is to take an unholy man out of an unholy world, make him holy, and put him back into that unholy world 
and keep him holy in it. If you don't know, Leonard Ravenhill is my all-time favorite preacher. It's been a while since I quoted him. So <laughs> I like to every once in a while. Uh, so Jesus says, I am the gate. I am the door. He also says, I am the good shepherd. And Jesus uses this parable to describe the Pharisees as hired hands, saying they don't care about other people. They're all in it for themselves. They're there for a position, payment, and power. As soon as danger comes, they run away. It says that the Pharisees didn't understand what Jesus was talking about. And if we go back a couple chapters to John chapter 8, we can see that the Pharisees were liars and thieves because Jesus said that the devil was their father, not Abraham. So if, if, if Jesus was lying during this parable, he would be speaking their native tongue. So why a shepherd? Out of all the positions in the world, why does Jesus use a shepherd to describe himself. Shepherds were prevalent in the area. They were relatable. People always saw them. It would be something easy for them to understand, but again, they didn't understand. Shepherds had a very good and long history in Israel. Angels appeared to the shepherds at the Christ's birth. Moses was a shepherd. Jacob's father-in-law was a shepherd. Rachel was a shepherd. David was a shepherd before he became a king. Amos was a shepherd who God used to proclaim a message of repentance to Israel. And God himself is called shepherd in other passages. If we look at Psalm 23, verses 1 through 6, it says, The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You, anoint my, you prepare a table in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Psalm 80, verse 1 says, Hear us, shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who sit enthroned between the cherubim, shine forth. Isaiah 40, 10 and 11 reads, See, the sovereign Lord comes with power, and he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him, and, he, and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. I have a little longer passage here. Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 1 through 16 says, The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, This is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to you, shepherds of Israel, who only take care of yourselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the curds, clothe yourself with the wool, and slaughter the choice animals, but you do not take care of the flock. You have not strengthened the weak, or healed the sick, or bound up the injured. You have not brought, brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And when they scattered, they became food for all the wild animals. My sheep wandered over all the mountains and on every high hill. They were scattered over the whole earth and no one searched or looked for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, because my flock lacks a shepherd, 
and so has been plundered and has become food for all the wild animals. And because my flock, therefore, you shepherd, sorry, and because my shepherds did not search for my flock, but cared for themselves rather than my flock, therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I am against the shepherds and will hold them accountable for my flock. I will remove them from tending the flock so that the shepherds can no longer feed themselves. I will rescue my flock from their mouths and it will no longer be food for them. For this is what the sovereign Lord says. I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places that they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. I will bring them out from the nations and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them into their own land. I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines, and in all the settlements in the land. I will tend them in a good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. There, will, there they will lie down in good grazing land, and there will be... And there they will feed in a rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will tend my sheep and have them lie down, declares the Sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak, but the sleek and strong I will destroy. I will shepherd the flock with justice. The shepherds that are referred to in Ezekiel, are referring to the Israelite leaders of the Old Testament, but we could use that to also describe the Pharisees. They only cared for themselves. It says, you eat the curds, you clothe yourselves with the wool, and you slaughter the choice animals, but you do not take care of the flock. You have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. It was all just for show for the Pharisees. They just wanted people to see them in their positions of power. They prayed on the street corners just to be seen and heard. When Jesus says, don't do that, pray to your father in your prayer closet. In Luke 18, 11 and 12, Jesus tells a parable of a Pharisee and tax collector. And in that parable, the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed and said, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector here. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all that I get. It was all just for show. Their hearts were not in it. They didn't care about the other people that they were supposed to be leading and getting them closer to God. As a result, the sheep were stolen from, they were scattered, and they were killed. If we look at John chapter 10 in context with John chapter 8 and John chapter 9, in John chapter 8 we see that there is a black sheep. The woman caught in adultery was singled out. The Pharisees used her as a black sheep. And in John chapter 9, we see a blind sheep. We see a blind man that Jesus healed. And he healed him on the Sabbath, which the Pharisees took. They were totally against that because it was the Sabbath. But we have to remember the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And the blind sheep that Jesus healed is referred to in chapter 10, verse 21, the last verse that we read, where it says that others said, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? This is what happened when man leaves God out of the situation. Local pastors are called to be under shepherds to the good shepherd. 1 Peter 5, 2 through 4 says, Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, 
Not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. See, Jesus' style of leadership is servant leadership. If we read in Mark chapter 10, Jesus says, If you want to be my disciple, you have to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. And he says, I have come to serve, not to be served. And he says, if you're in a position of leadership, don't lord it over, one, over everyone, but serve them. So as a result of everything that we just read in Ezekiel and in John, God becomes the shepherd. He saves those who are lost and dying. He finds those who have been scattered. He leaves the 99 to find the one. And elsewhere it says that he has compassion on crowds who are like sheep without a shepherd. There are also passages in Scripture where the people of God are referred to sheep, as sheep. Psalm 95, 6 and 7 says, Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Psalm 100, verse 3 says, Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Jesus says, I lay down my life. If we look at the history of shepherds in Israel, a good example is David. And David saved his own sheep from bears and lions. And it says, when a lion or bear would come and carry off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Being a shepherd is a dangerous job. As I said earlier, they had to bring the sheep back into the pen at nighttime because there were just so many predators. There's lions, bears, wolves. And if you think about it, we usually see David as a 13-year-old when he is shepherding his flock and killing those bears and lions to save his sheep. What 13-year-old do you know that's doing that? So God saw how David fought for his sheep and appointed him king over all of Israel. It's like, I see you, David. I see how you're taking care of these sheep. Now take care of my sheep. The Pharisees tried to kill Jesus three times at least before this passage in John chapter 10 and at least five times altogether throughout his life. So it's not like they finally caught him and killed him. No, Jesus says, I lay down my own life. He willingly laid down his life for his sheep. Jesus is both the good shepherd and the lamb of God. If we read earlier in John chapter, chapters 1 and 3, John is saying to his, John the Baptist is saying to his followers when he sees Jesus, Behold, there is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And Jesus says, I have come to bring life. He brings life by laying down his life, only to take it up again. He says that, He has the authority from the Father to do both of those things. If you remember a while back, I preached a sermon called The Strategy We Know, and I used the first half of 
John 10.10, 10, where it says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And that's the strategy of the enemy. And if you read in 1 John, you can see the three ways that he does that, or at least tries to do that, through the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Every temptation that you ever face will fall under one of those three categories. But it is God's strategy to provide life. Jesus says, Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full, have it abundantly. And we can have this life because he laid down his life and took it back up. This includes eternal life with him, but it also includes abundant life with him while we are still on earth. Jesus didn't say, just save us so that we could go to heaven. We have a job to do here on the earth. And we can have abundant life with each other as a church, sharing with one another, encouraging one another, edifying one another, lifting each other up. And Jesus also says, I have other sheep that are not part of this sheep pen. They are not part of this fold. He says, I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Salvation is first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. Jesus is referring to the Gentiles when he says, I have other sheep that are not part of this fold. If you read in Romans, it says that the church is grafted into the family of Israel, into the family of God, thereby forming one flock with one shepherd. In Romans 8, 16, it says that we know we are adopted because the Holy Spirit makes witness to our spirit that we are the children of God. And we know we are adopted because we know the good shepherd and we know his voice. And Jesus says that there will be one flock with one shepherd. There is to be unity within the flock. This past Wednesday night in class, um, we were going through Galatians chapter 5. And we were talking about unity within the body of Christ. And Pastor Witter mentioned that unity is not the end goal, but it's part it's a, it's a way to get to the end goal. It's part of it. Because you can have unity, but have the wrong purpose for that unity. We could all be united and build the next Tower of Babel. Or we could be united and preach the gospel. There are still other sheep out there outside of these walls, out in our communities, out in our state, out in our country, across the world. Jesus has given us the great commission. We are to proclaim the gospel. We are to teach others his teachings. We're not alone when we do that either. We have each other, and most importantly, we have the Holy Spirit with us. And it says in Scripture that when we don't know what to say, the Holy Spirit will guide us and show us what to say. So to continue with what we've been saying the last few weeks, I want to encourage everyone to invite at least one person to church. We're entering Easter season, Resurrection Sunday is coming up in a month, less than a month. I just want to encourage everyone to invite at least one person. And if those people come, just look around you. The size of the congregation would double. I've been inviting people to church. I'd like to encourage you to do the same. Jesus is the good shepherd. There are still sheep out there. Let's share the gospel with them.
Lord Jesus, I thank you that you are the good shepherd and that you are also the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Which means that you showed us, the rest of your sheep, how to follow you, how to follow the Father. You don't take us anywhere that you haven't been, Lord. It's not like you take us somewhere and you're surprised by events that happen. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would fill all of us, that you would endue us with power from on high to be bold witnesses for you, Lord, to proclaim your gospel message, to invite others to church, and to seek and save those who are lost by the power of your Holy Spirit. There are other sheep out there, Lord. I ask that you would give us boldness and authority and courage to share your message with them. Because you, you are so patient, Lord, because you don't want anyone to go to hell. You want to bring as many people to heaven and be with you. I thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen.